Good morning. Welcome to our worship services this morning. Welcome to those who are on Zoom and those that are joining us on Truth FM today. Be blessed in our worship together, for we have come to praise the Lord. And our first prayer will be led by our brother Brian at this time. Could the congregation please be upstanding for our opening prayer this morning? Father, we are so thankful that we can be here this morning to put ourselves before you, Father, to offer ourselves in an act of worship, Father. We pray that you'll bless us and uh, the love that we give here this morning, Father, that we honour you, Father, that as we praise your name, as we sing your praises, Father, that, that it moves you, Father, that it uh, that it brings us closer to you. Father, be with those who couldn't be here this morning and bless us as we seek to be like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning all. Thank us all to stand for the first song last week. We give thanks to God. Number, num it's from number 92, if you're following in the books. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, only from his own abode, on the rock of ages founded, walk and shade thy sure repose, with salvation's walk surrounded, thou mayst smile at all. Thy foes. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. Well, supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want removed. Who can faint what? Such a river ever flows that does to sage. This which lies the Lord, the giver, never fails from age to age. Savior, sins of Zion City, fly through grace amen. Testament readings this morning is from 2 Kings 18, 26, through to the end of that chapter. <coughs> King of Assyria here thinks he can walk all over everyone, but that's not going to happen. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkai, and Shebna and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. 
Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own system until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new, vine, new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim, Hena and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his hand from me, his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply, because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and jo, Joa, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. Amen. The New Testament reading this morning is from the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 1, we'll be reading from verses 1 through 8. It's Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and, and from the, the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us, uh, from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the cloud, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Number 722. 
Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wonderful passion and purity. May his spirit divine, no more in reply. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. into living right within society. Parents, grandparents, teachers, members, uh, church members and professional psychologists play a significant role in the child's development and into positive growth, both at psychological and physical age level. As you know, Lord, the youth grown into adults can develop thoughts and ideas that can be imp implemented into doing wrong. Our Father, please allow the church to have a significant role in the growth of the youth into living right for you. <clears throat> Our Father, please allow the church to share, to share the word of God so that they are being fed spiritually from scripture and allow us to teach your love to them through your grace and mercy. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> three, three, two. Sing on my life, I come in now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy fall from thou, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Show me the truth where thou was laid, tenderly mourned and wed. Angels in rooms of life shall reign, God as they was thou slept. Lest I forget this. Sure. 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When praying for the Lord's Supper this morning, I struggled with, for different reasons. I struggled with what to say that's, you know, new and unique, that's never been heard before. Then I came across those words. And I'll tell you, it hit me hard. And it made me struggle. And I'll tell you why I struggled. Let's build the picture. See if you turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, and starting from verse 39. And it says, he went out and made his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he told them, pray that you may not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Just picture that. Jesus, with his disciples, walks with them through the Kindron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he leaves them and he goes to pray alone. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the film, The Passion of the Christ, but in this scene, you see Jesus and there's music in the background, and you see him walking over, leaving the disciple, and he's, and he's stumbling. He's stumbling over. And we can picture it. Jesus just had the Last Supper with them. He just told them that one of them is going to betray him. He just told Peter that he's going to deny him. And Jesus knows what's about to happen. It all just got to him so much that he dropped. He knelt. You know, back then, the typical Jewish prayer, the posture of that was to, to be standing, lifting your, your head up and your eyes wide open to heaven. But for Jesus, his posture was different. It's different from any other time we ever see him pray. Why? Was it to humble himself before God? Was it to plead to the Father? Was it the stress of what he's been through? 
Was it the stress of knowing what he's about to go through? But for whatever the reason was, he left his disciples. He said, Father, you are willing. Take this cup from me. Take this pain from me. Take the betrayal of one of my twelve. Take the denial of one of my closest friends. Take away the pain, the suffering. The judging, the embarrassment, the shame, the abuse, the mocking, the spitting, the beating, the cross. What a cross. Anyway, we can see that it's all too much. Because in verse 44 of Luke chapter 22, what does it say? Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. The medical term for this is called hematidrosis. And this is where the blood capillary vessels that feed the sweat glands, they rupture, causing them to excrete blood. And all that occurs under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. Just picture that. Our Lord and Saviour. But with all that, Jesus still says, but not my will, but yours. Jesus knows what he's going to go through. But he still leaves it up to us. He still puts it. For it is written, he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root of dry, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned away to our own, to our own way. For the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? But he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. And with all that Jesus went through, one of the last things he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What? This is where I struggle. This is where I can't get my head around. Forgive them. After everything they put you through, You know, the more you look into it, you, you realize that Jesus wasn't just speaking to the people there. He's speaking to us. He interceded for us. 
He says, Father, forgive them. Forgive Edmund. Forgive Ronnie. Forgive Johnny. Forgive Chris. Forgive Adam. Forgive Nicola. Forgive Pete. Forgive Dick. Forgive Emma. Forgive us all. The prayer on that cross is shocking. The, the prayer on the cross is gracious. The prayer on the cross is huge. And the prayer on the cross is answered. It's shocking because Jesus has never said that to the Father before. Normally, Jesus himself would forgive others. And we see examples of that throughout Scripture. So why is it different this time? It's because he's carrying all our sins on his shoulder. He's about to be forsaken. If there was ever a time where Jesus' humanity came, comes to the fore, it's here. It's a human prayer from the Son of God. It's a gracious prayer because Jesus is interceding here for us. He's pleading to the Father on our behalf. Remember, he's blameless. He's sinless. Yet he's praying for the soldiers. He's praying for Pilate. He's praying for all those watching. And he's praying for us. He's asking for us not to suffer the way he has. He's asking for forgiveness for us. Who put him there? This prayer is a huge prayer because it's a cry out to everyone. It's a plea for everyone. Everyone who is there. Everyone who reads the words. Everyone who hears the words. He's telling us that the life he lived, the things he done and the, and the things he said were all true. He's telling us that he is the son of God who came to die for our sin. Who came to intercede for us. Who came to bear our sins and who came to be our savior. And it's an answered prayer. Because just as Jesus was asking for forgiveness, he was providing our means of forgiveness. On the cross, under God's wrath, suffering for our sins, we beat the merits of Jesus' blood. For there is no, for if there was no shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have saved himself. He could have been freed. But he died. He died for you and I. And you know what? Though I struggle with the words, Father, forgive them. I am so thankful for them. Because Jesus refused to save himself, he saved us. Our salvation was won by his precious blood and kingly intercession. This simple gesture holds such a powerful representation of our life, our worth, and our salvation. Brethren, let us never forget this. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now. We use this time, Father, to reflect. To reflect on that sacrifice that was made for us. And Father, sometimes we just struggle with what to say. Because that gift, that sacrifice is indescribable. For Jesus to sacrifice himself and take our place. It's hard to grasp. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that death. We thank you for that shedding of blood. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. 
And Father, we pray that you bless every head that's bowed. And help us never to take this moment for granted. Never to take the sacrifice for granted. Never to take our forgiveness for granted. But to reflect on it daily. And to reflect on it in our lives. And to show others him through ourselves. Father, we pray for the unleavened bread as symbol of his body. Pray that you bless every head that takes it, Father. This is our prayer to you through your son's name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you again to pray for the fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed so freely for us. And Father, <laughs> we pray that you forgive our sins. Forgive us always, Father, for what we do and for some things that we don't even realize that we do. Forgive us for the, the thoughts we have that we don't put into action. Forgive us for the thoughts we do have that we do put into action. Father, forgive us and help us also to forgive each other. Father, it's almost laughable that we let such small things get in the way of our relationships with each other. We let things that are uncomparable to what we've done to you. Yet, Father, yet you love us so much and you still forgive us. Father, help us to reflect on this example and let us be an example to each other. This is our prayer to you, Father, for your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. For the centurion, Jesus' prayer was answered. For the thousands of Jews at Pentecost, Jesus' prayer was answered. For many of us here and online, Jesus' prayer was answered. If you're here today or you're listening, what about you? Has Jesus' prayer been answered for you? Have you come to God through him? And if we have, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Those following along their books at 601. 601. <clears throat> My God and I were in the field together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows here. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows here. 
Sermon reading is from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. John 13, verses 12 to 17. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another. Have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you, Ron, for reading that for us this morning. Graham's made things a lot easier for me because he's attached the, the little uh, battery pack to the microphone. So now I don't have to mess with putting that on the floor and everything. What, what do you want to be when you grow up? Can you put that slide, the first slide up there? What do you want to be when you grow up? Remember, remember uh, we used to used to hear that question a lot. When I was, when I was a teenager, when I was like Cameron's age, People would say that a lot. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I don't know. I don't seem to hear that as much anymore. Uh, maybe I'm just out of those circles. Maybe it's because I'm old now. But uh, I, I don't hear, you know, not all the kids that we, we work with, I don't really hear that question being asked as much. Here's a little graph. It might be too small to see. But here is a comparison of the top 25 dream jobs of, of children. Uh, back then, in in the, my, the olden days, our day, you know, uh, compared to maybe children now, and you'll see, you'll see, I can't even you see, you'll see some of the things that's got, you know, the usual astronaut and teacher and and uh, fireman. Uh, I think there's uh, probably actor up there somewhere and, and footballer and all that sort of thing. You you you'll see all of those up there. The, the the glory ones, you know, are into space or putting out fires or, you know, earning lots of money on the football pitch, whatever it might be. And there's a few in there that are more helping others oriented, like, like teacher would be one of those, or nurse, I'm sure, is up there in one of those columns and, and doctor and that sort of thing. And psychologists have been saying that even with those ones, the, the reason that children want to... to go into that field is because they maybe see someone in their life, like maybe a teacher when they were younger, uh, or, you know, a doctor or nurse, who made an impact in their life, who changed their life, and they want to be that. They want to have that kind of impact in someone else's life. So there's still a wee, there's still a wee element, psychologists say, still a wee element in there of, you know, I want to be something important, you know, something big, something that we can all recognize. What you'll notice is that in both, and I, I was quite actually, uh, found it quite humorous that cowboy is actually on both lists. <laughs> but anyway, what you won't find is servant. It's not on there. You, you'll see actor, but what you won't see is backstage worker. What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to work backstage. Switch on. No, nobody says that. It just doesn't appeal. Nobody seems to want to be the servant. And yet my topic this morning, which we chose a year ago, is getting to grips with service. We'll finish with that now, Graham. Um, getting to grips. I'm supposed... Here, here's, a, here's something that doesn't seem to appeal to anybody. And I'm supposed to come up here this morning and say, yeah, this is what we should, we, this is what we should, should aspire to. This is what we should want to be. 
this was an issue for the disciples. You can tell from the text, this was an issue for the disciples as well. Picture here of God washing feet. Now, nobody else was offering to do it. Jesus gets up because nobody, not because, but nobody did get up before Jesus. None of the others got up and got the basin and the towel and thought, you know, I'm going to do this for my fellow disciples and my Lord. To, to be fair, Peter was uncomfortable with Jesus doing it. He recognized something not right with this picture. But he wasn't offering to do it himself. He was uncomfortable with Jesus doing it. He probably had in his mind, Matthew should be doing this or something. You know, not him. He's not offering. This wasn't a new issue for the disciples. Remember back, remember back in Mark 9? Um, keep a marker in John 13, because obviously we'll come back there. Back in Mark 9, you'll remember that this had been a problem previously. Look at verse uh, 33 and 34. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. <laughs> this, this had already been a problem for the disciples. Who's the greatest they're talking about? Remember also back in Matthew chapter 20, uh, you'll see again how this was an issue. Look at verse 20 and 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in the kingdom. Her position, and they were with her, as, her sorry, her concern, and they were with, with her. So it was their concern as well, was position, glory. What do you want to be when you grow up? Ah, oh, want one of us to sit at Jesus' right hand and wanted to sit at Jesus' left hand in the kingdom. We'll be in the position. We'll have the authority. Service didn't excite these disciples. They had, they had other things on their mind. They had other things on their, their agenda. They were more about, they were more about who's going to be the greatest than who can, who can serve. They were more about the, the dramatic and the thrilling than the stuff behind the scenes. They were more about the impressive than what can I do for you? And they got some of that, you know, what the, those those things that they were looking for with Christ, they got some of that. Even, even if we stick in John, even if we stick in the Gospel of John and go through a couple of the instances, in, in chapter 6, uh, verse 14 and 15, and, and you'll, you'll know the story when Jesus, Jesus is feeding the 5,000 and he's just fed them now. And in 14 and 15, it says, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And the disciples, they had a front row seat for this. 5,000 men, five loaves and two fishes, feeds them all, 12 baskets of leftovers. And the disciples are thinking, we're on to something great here. We, and, and the message then, the message that Jesus then gave after this, this, uh, this miracle, and we see that in the rest of the chapter, you're going to have to follow me. You see that in verses 53 and 54, the kind of following that Jesus is looking for. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds in my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, so there's good to come, but you're going to have to follow, and it's going to be have to, it's going to have to be complete, and it's going to have to be bold, and it's going to have to be fearless, because it's not going to be easy. And the disciple says, we're in. 
we know later on, John chapter 6, some left, and Jesus said, you're going to leave as well. And the disciples said, no, we're staying. After what we just saw, we're with you. The 12 bought into that. It gets even better if you're looking for the dramatic and the great. It gets even better just shortly after in John chapter 9. Uh, let's read verse 35 through 39 of John 9. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. This, this is after Jesus has healed the blind man, remember? Okay. And uh, Jesus has heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, Jesus went looking for him. Having found him, he says, do you believe the son of, in the Son of Man? The blind, the blind man who can now see answered, said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you've seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. This is even better than the feeding the 5,000. Here's a man who's been blind from birth. Jesus heals him, and he can see. And the blind man fell from says to the Pharisees, this has never been known in the history of the world. Disciples have got a front row seat, and the message, the message is even better the blind can see. And he's not just talking about physical blindness. Because he's talking about the Pharisees and how they're blind in this passage. And the 12 are looking at this and they're saying, this is worth following. This is great. And, and we're in. We're part, of the, we're part of the main group. Gets even better in John 11. You'll know where I'm going with this one. Go to John 11. Let's read... Uh, just 23 to 26 on this on, for this event. And Jesus has now arrived at the home of Lazarus. And uh, Martha's come out. And, he's, and uh, he says, beginning in verse uh, 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And he goes on to raise Lazarus from the dead. And the disciples are there, front and centre. And the message is, I'm the one that can, I'm, I'm the one that can give you new life. And I just raised a man physically from the dead to prove the kind of power that I have. New life, you can have. The 12, the 12, they can live with that. Maybe even die for it. They're in. It doesn't get any bigger than this. This is dramatic. And then, as we near the climax, and it's been building up, feeding 5,000 with just a few loaves and fish, healing a man that's been blind from birth, raising a man from the dead, and then he gets to John 13. And let's read some of that again. Let's read verse 14 and 15 again. John 13. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And all of a sudden, it's gone downhill. I'll follow you, Jesus. After what you've done with the 5,000 men, I'll follow you. What you've done with that blind man, I can see where you're going. I can see myself in this for life. Raising a man from the dead. You're my king. Washing feet. Follow my example. He must be talking about the example of all the great stuff. He's saying, follow my example here. This is the message. No miracle. Nothing great. Nothing thrilling. Nothing inspiring. Nothing moving. That they can get their teeth into and, and be a part of. And follow Jesus in those ways. And everybody will think, oh, these are the 12 disciples. Look at the great things that they're doing for the great God that they're following. And all he's doing is washing feet. 
and call on himself a servant and asking them to follow his example. And it's washing feet. It's not just serving. It's washing feet of all things. Doesn't have the same meaning in our culture, but we know. We've been, we've been in the word long enough. We know what this kind of service is. And the God of all creation <clears throat> bends down on his knees and washes the dirty feet of the ones who had not long ago been arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And it's not a comfortable picture. We're thinking, Jesus, you are serving in a way that is beneath you here. What would we rather him do? Is there a is there a, a, an avenue of service that we think would be more fitting to the God of all creation? Is there something that we think would fit his position more? Would we say, Jesus, don't wash the feet, set, set the cutlery out or something. You know, you, you do that. Go and get the juice. None of it is. God bends down and serves the disciples. And they're not keen to follow. So why should we be? We should make it so appealing to us. I'll just give you a couple of things this morning. First of all, there is life. There is life in serving like Jesus. And we're not just talking about normal serving. You'll see that in a minute. We're talking about serving like Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse 5. And we'll read through to verse 8. We'll read a couple other verses in this chapter as well. Matthew 23. So remember, there is life in serving like Jesus. And, and the reason, let me just tell you before we read this, the reason there's life in serving like Jesus, because the humility that it takes to serve like Jesus makes us correctable. All right? When we have that kind of humility to serve like Jesus, we become correctable. You'll see where we're going with this in a minute. Look at verse 5. Um, they do, he's talking about the Pharisees here, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honour at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. Look at verse um, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Look at verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Jesus has given us a picture through the Pharisees of those who don't have the humility that's required to make them correctable. They're not serving like Jesus. They're serving for the glory. They're serving to be great. They're serving for the places of honor. They're serving so everybody will think, oh, these guys are amazing. There's no humility here. This is, this is a picture of service without humility. We can still serve. And that's why there's a difference between serving like Jesus serves and just serving. Because Jesus humbled himself. And if we're going to serve like Jesus, we're going to have to have that humility that makes us correctable. Jesus leaves them in no doubt in verse 12. He says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's a big deal. Being humble makes us, makes us correctable. Well, being correctable makes us savable. Say that again. Being correctable makes us savable. Look at Psalm 50. 50th Psalm. Uh, 
and look at verse 16 and 17 and then verse 23. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. Not correctable. I don't want to be corrected. I don't want you to tell me what to do, God. I don't want you to tell me what's right and wrong. I don't have that kind of humility. Look what happens to them in verse 23. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Not to the guy in verse 16 and 17. Not to the guy who's not going to order his way rightly according to the word of God. He's not going to be shown salvation. Being humble enough to be correctable makes us savable. Because it means we have a heart that will listen. That will listen to someone who knows better. In this case, God, obviously, in a perfect way. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. And look at verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> Beginning verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. It's talking about those who, rather than listen to God, would rather live their own way by their own arrogance, according to their own ego. I heard the good thing on the radio this morning as I was driving to pick Mary up, and a guy was talking about ego. He says, you know what I, you know what I call ego? Edging God out. I've never heard that before. That's pretty good. Don't put that as words of the week, because that wasn't me that said that. It was someone else. Ego. Edging God out. People who live by their own arrogance, rather than, rather than by listening to the will of God. Graham, can you put up the couple of other translations there? There's one from the Common English version. There will come a time, this is just verse 3 on its own, there will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching, they will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. You put the next one up, it's the voice translation, I think. Yeah, because a time will come when some will no longer tolerate sound teaching. Instead, they will live by their own desires. They'll scratch their itching ears by surrounding themselves with teachers who approve of their lifestyles and tell them what they want to hear. We see that all the time. That's why we have 3,000 different denominations at least. In the Western world alone. And they're going to be lost. Because if we're not correctable, we're not savable. If God can't say what's right and wrong, if God can't direct us, if God can't lead us, if we can't listen to that, we're not savable. We're not going to be on the path that he leads. There's something else though. There's joy in serving like Jesus. So there's life in serving like Jesus eternally. And even here, but that's another lesson. Right? Eternally. There's also joy in serving like Jesus. Look at Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. You'll see this. Verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Cannot serve two masters, he says. It kind of seems possible to serve two masters. I, mean, I guess you could. Paul, you've got two jobs, haven't you? Yeah, yeah you've got two bosses. Paul serves two masters. Splits his time between them. It's not possible to serve two masters the way Jesus is talking about. Paul doesn't serve his boss the way he serves his God. Jesus is talking about a kind of service here that takes devotion. He's talking about a kind of service here that where, where the master is not just number one, it's just he's the master. 
You don't have a number two. Thankfully, when you have God as the master, all your other priorities fall into place because he wants you to do the right thing with him. But he's talking about a kind of service here that takes devotion. He's talking about when you're serving like me, the devotion just becomes a natural thing. Look what it provokes. That Look what that kind of devotion provokes. You'll see it in 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 8. And uh, I think that, yeah, this is the Queen of Sheba who is talking to Solomon about his servants, okay? And, he, and she says, happy are your men, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Look at the New English Translation version, what it says, the same verse. Your attendants who stand before you all times, Solomon, and hear your wise sayings are truly happy. They were finding joy in serving Solomon. There's joy in serving like Jesus. They were finding joy in serving like Solomon. Listen, it can't just be because he was always right. All right? It can't. He was the wisest man in the world. But their joy of serving him can't just have been because he was always right. Because we've known people like that who think they're always right. I've been accused of that, but that's not true because I was wrong once and I admitted it, you know. But we've known people who think they're always right. And we don't always love them. <laughs> and if we don't, they certainly don't bring us joy. They were serving a man here in Solomon that they loved. And, that, and they served him in love. And they loved to serve him. And it brought them joy. They were happy. You know, I've used this before, but you remember the you remember the lady who was married to the to the guy who was abusive, and he, he was very demanding. And he would like, you know, when I come home from work, my dinner better be on the table, and I don't want to talk. I want peace and quiet. I want my favourite TV program on, and this better be tidied, and this better be done, and you better have taken care of this. And he says, "Here's a list," and he put it up on the fridge. <laughs> You make sure they're done when I come home. Now life was miserable. Love smiling. Johnson must be like that. <laughs> Johnson, you're not like that, are you? Our no. life was miserable. Well, the man died. And she married another. Oh, they were so happy. And after a few years of marriage, she was going through some old stuff and tidying up. And she found this list that her first husband used to put on the fridge. You know what she realized? She was doing all the stuff on the list. Didn't even think about it. Because she loved the husband. She loved this man. There was joy in doing those things, making sure they had a, a home that he was glad to come home to and making sure that he was well fed. And You know, she loved doing all those things because she loved them. There was joy in that kind of service. Go back to Genesis chapter 29 if you want another Bible example of this. In fact, even if you don't, go back there anyway, because that's where we're going. Genesis chapter 29, I think uh, verse 10. And you'll know this, you'll know this story as well. Uh, sorry, verse 20, it's not verse 10. Genesis 29, verse 20. So Jacob, this is when Jacob, Jacob's he's saw the, the girl that he wants to marry. Oh, he loves her. And our dad Laban says, oh, you've got to work seven years. and Work for me seven years, then you get to marry her, right? So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. He was glad to do it, to marry the girl that he loved. How time flies, even when you're serving if it's for one that you love. There was joy in that. Jacob was more than happy to serve in this capacity for the one that he loved. The love that he had for Rachel gave his service a whole new meaning. It brought joy to those 
two and a half thousand plus days of serving. But there's something more important. Yes, there's life in serving like Jesus. Yes, yes, there's joy in serving like Jesus. But more importantly, and this is it, there's freedom in serving like Jesus. Because the nature required to do that makes us more Christ-like. There's joy, there's there's um there's joy in serving like Jesus because the devotion that's required brings us that joy. And there's life because the humility that's required that bring, uh, makes us correctable. But there is freedom in serving like Jesus because the nature that's required for that makes us Christ-like. Go back to Matthew 20. Again, been there before. But go back to Matthew 20. Let's look at verse 28. Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, I came to serve. And here's the question. There's freedom in serving like Jesus because the nature required to serve like that makes us more like him. Well, when Jesus came to serve, when he says he, did, he, said, he says that he did here, is this a temporary interruption to his normal life? To his regular existence? To who he actually is? Is this, is this uh, you know, being a servant a new experience for him? Or was it always so? Go to Philippians 2. You know we have to go there at some point. Philippians 2. Let's just look at verse 6 and 7. First, the first 11 verses, one of my favorite passages, but let's just look at verse 6 and 7. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Graham, can you put that next slide up? Because we're going to get a wee bit technical here on you. Just, but it's, it's not too hard. Just bear with me on this. You see that, you see that phrase, um, he was, in the ESV, it's he was. He was in the form of God. If you've got NIV or King James Version, it'll be being in the form of God. If you get any other version, find that little phrase there that's, that, that fits that translation. Although he was in the form of God, that is called, you have to remember this, but I put it up there because you might remember it more. That is called a circumstantial participle in Greek. A circumstantial participle, he was. It means you have to translate it depending on the context or the circumstances of the rest of the passage. Okay? And it can mean, it can, it'll mean one of two things. It'll either be what's known as concessive, which means in spite of, or it will be a, a, a circumstantial participle that expresses cause. Forget all of this. It's just, it's interesting. If you remember it, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Get the point in a wee minute. So it's either going to be concessive, in other words, in spite of, or it's going to be expressing cause where it's because of. And that's all contained in this little phrase, he was, this circumstantial participle. So let me give you an example. Um, this, this example, when I was thinking about it, worked a whole lot better two weeks ago. And I'll, you'll see why in a minute. David might say, being an East Stirlingshire fan, East Stirling or East Stirlingshire? Being an East Stirlingshire fan, I predict that we will win the Scottish Cup. Now, they were knocked out two weeks ago, and that's why it doesn't work anymore. But two weeks ago, if I'd said that, being an East Stirlingshire fan, I predict that we will win the Scottish Cup. That word being in the Greek would be the circumstantial participle. In David's case, that would be concessive. Because David, really what we'd be saying is, look, in spite of the fact that I am an East Stirlingshire fan, I predict that we will win the Scottish Cup. 
he is conceding that that is not consistent with the nature and standing of this football club. This is unlikely. Well, this is probably not going to happen, but I'm going to predict it anyway. So it's concessive. Now, Mike might say, being a Celtic fan, Mike might say, being a Glasgow Celtic fan, I predict that we will win the Scottish Cup. He's expressing cause. The present part, the circumstantial participle is expressing cause there. He's saying because, not in spite of, in spite of being an East Stirlingshire fan, he's saying because I'm a Celtic fan, I predict we'll win the Scottish Cup. He's saying this, is, this outcome is consistent with the nature and standing and the ability of my club. This is something that's likely to happen. Yeah. You see the difference? Let me explain it in, let me explain it in, in terms of um, the, uh, the, path, the, the verse 6 here. I think I've got a slide about that, Graham. Have I got the next slide? I think it's that. Yeah. So if we were to, if we were to read Philippians 2, 6 as concessive, in spite of, it would be in spite of the fact that Jesus was in nature God, he poured himself out, taking, the very na taking on the very nature of a servant. That's if the circumstantial participle is concessive. So in other words, Jesus is God, big, great, high, not a servant. But in spite of that, he goes ahead and becomes a servant. That's if it's concessive. If it's expressing cause, can you get the next one, Graham? It would say precisely because he was in the very nature of God, he poured himself out by taking the form of a bond servant born in the likeness of men. Now, what that's explaining, how you would interpret that is, because Jesus is God, because he is already a servant as God, what he does is he empties himself and becomes a servant in the form of men, of a man. The emptying of himself is not that he has changed from being a non-servant to a servant, in this case, expressing cause, the change is he has gone from being a servant as God, spirit, to being a servant as God in the body of a man. That's the emptying part. We're talking about Jesus here being a servant all the time. The New, the New American Standard Version, we put that slide up, it, it actually translates it quite well. Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a, of a bond servant being born in the likeness of men. You see, when you take that comma away, some of your translations will have a comma um, between bond servant and being. So it would read, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bond servant being born in the likeness of men. So he emptied himself and became a servant. And he, became, and he put himself on a man's body to do it. No, take the comma away. He emptied himself by becoming a servant in the body of a man. He was already the servant. If you think through it, the, the entire history of the world, God has been serving us since time began. Identifying what we need and providing it. Seeing where we need to go, showing us the way making the path, doing what needed to be done so that we could get that forgiveness, serving that need, feeding us in the wilderness, delivering us from slavery, whatever. God's been serving us the whole time. John Ortberg said it well when he says, when Jesus came as a servant, he wasn't disguising who God is, he was revealing who God is. I even remember what book he said that in. When Jesus came, when Jesus came as a servant, he wasn't disguising who God is. He was revealing who God is. And we can be like him. We can be Christ-like. What does that have to do with freedom, though? You've said the freedom in serving like Jesus does. Well, because if we become Christ-like, that frees us from any other comparison. Frees us from all other comparisons. We, we, we're all about comparisons. We love to be comparatively impressive. How are you doing? Ah, well, not so great, but 
doing better than Ivan, you know. So I can feel a bit better about myself, you know. We do that all the time. We compare ourselves to others. Remember, um, remember in Luke 18, if I was seeing the tax collector, Luke 18, look at verse 11. Comparisons. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer, tax collector. We compare. We do that. We've already been in Mark 9. Remember the disciples? Who's the greatest? Comparing themselves to one another. What about the older brother? Uh, just back a few pages and look chapter 15. Look 15, look at verse uh, 29 and 30. This is the older brother whose who's wee brother's the prodigal son. And he's just came back. And the dad's thrown him a party, fatted calf, all that kind of stuff. And the older brother comes home. And he says, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, but yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. What's the older brother doing? He's comparing himself. I'm better than him. I've been with you the whole time. I've been living better than him. I've been serving you. I've been doing more than him. He's comparing himself. That's what we do. And look where it gets us. We become like that Pharisee of those disciples arguing about who's the greatest or this older brother who's now going to have a problem with his younger brother. Look where it gets us. Could it be that we could be so Christ-like that nothing else compares? Can you imagine? The MT's video said, can you imagine if we could be more like God? Could you imagine being so Christ-like that nothing else compares? Where if someone says, what are you doing these days? And you said, I'm serving like Jesus. <laughs> what else are you going to say? What, what are they going to say that's going to top that? That's the end of the comparison. We do the I'm serving like Jesus. End of comparison. What do you want to be when you grow up? They expect you to say fireman or something. I want to be more like Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, okay, that's 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 a good that's a good target. <laughs> I, I don't know what you say to that. What's your greatest achievement in life? I am, I am humbly serving in the mode of Jesus, the Son of God. <sighs> of course, you can't say that or else you kind of lose your greatest achievement because you're bragging about it. But you know what I mean? You know, what, what, what else is anybody going to say about that? Let me tell you. Nicole's not here this morning. When, when, when people ask me, people maybe uh, who have not seen Nicole for a few years or whatever like that, and they'll say, how's Nicole doing? Do you know my first answer? Do you know the first thing I say to them? And I know what they mean. Where's she working? You know, what's she doing these days? Is she married? Has she got kids? Blah, blah. Do you know the first thing I say to them, Mike? What's, how's Nicole doing? What's Nicole doing these days? She's faithful. That's my first answer. It's not me. You know, is it because I'm ashamed that, or, or, of what she is doing? Or she just works in the shop, does very well in the shop, very highly thought of and all that. Is it, is it because I wish she was doing more with her life? Is it because I wish she was already married and had kids and we had grandkids and all the rest of it? Is it because I'm embarrassed? No. It's because there's nothing. That's the biggie. She's faithful. That's the, nothing gets bigger than that. And there are others, her age, you know, who are often engaged or married or, or, what, or loads of money or whatever it might, whatever it might be. And they're gone. Or maybe they were never here. Some are here and are gone. And that's the big one for me. She's faithful. That's my answer. Because nothing else compares. Let's close uh, this morning, this afternoon, and look chapter 6. Look chapter 6, verse 40. <clears throat> A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Who do you want to be when you grow up? 
want to be like Jesus, the servant God, the God of the towel. And we know from the stories about Jesus, he's done some great things, inspiring and all the rest of it, but he didn't just look for the big things. We're talking about being like Jesus, all right? We're talking about serving like Jesus. He didn't just look for the big things. We shouldn't either. Some, okay, yes, yeah, sometimes he served with a miracle. I'll grant you that. Sometimes he just served with a touch. Sometimes he just served with a word. Sometimes you just serve with a look, a hand, small things. Jesus served. Those things might sound unimpressive to the world. They want to do great things. They want to be impressive. They want to be dramatic. But think how rich our lives would be if we served like Jesus did in the little things. Think how free we would be if we humbly served like Jesus. I said close with um, Luke 6, but let's let's just do one other. Mark, Mark chapter 9. Let's just finish here. Mark chapter 9. Back there. We've already been here. Look at verse 33 to 35. When they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way but they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. That's where we stopped last time. But then in verse 35, Jesus said, and he sat that it says, and he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be a last of all and servant of all. When Jesus is saying that, he's not giving orders. He's not giving orders there. He's describing how his kind of world would look. He's describing what the world would look like if we could get to grips with service. Now, as a church, we could offer incentives. Oh, if you serve, this is what we'll do for you. This is what you'll get. We could do that. Probably get some more volunteers. Or we could maybe we could maybe put you on a guilt trip. Oh, if you don't help out with this, if you don't serve in this way, oh, it's going to be, you never know. We could do that. Maybe get some more volunteers that way. We could make it compulsory. Uh, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to come to a big family fellowship unless you help clean the building. <coughs> well, might get some more volunteers that way. But surely, the best thing is for us to realize that we are never more like Christ than when we are serving. Never more like him, because that's who he is. We are never more like Christ than when we are serving. This, this, I just thought of this when I was sitting down. So you, you're familiar with the song, um, Make Me a Servant? You know the word to that one? Because they're not up, I didn't think about it in time. I should have thought about that and asked Pete to lead that. Make me a servant. Let's just sing that together. So in case you don't know, it's, the words are, make me a servant, make me. Lord, make me a servant, make me like you, for you are a servant, make me one too. Make me a servant, do what you must do, for you are a servant, you are, see that? You are a servant, make me one too. Let's sing that through twice, <clears throat> then we'll hand you over to Pete. Make me a servant, Lord, make me like you, for you are a servant.
as you were speaking there, I was, I was, I, the worst, another song came up to me, and it was to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, is all I ask, is to be like Him. And through life's journey from last earth to glory, all I ask is to be like Him. And it goes on to say, to love like Jesus, to share like Jesus. And we can, we can put so many different verses to the attributes that Jesus shows us. So let us sing what I've selected here. Take my life and let it be consecrated to the Lord to thee. Take my hands, my voice, my silver and my gold, my love. Our dedication to him should go to every part of our being and to every thought that comes into our head. There we go. Take my life and let it be consecrated to afternoon brothers and sisters we just sang the song now take all my gold and all my silver i'm not sure whether we really mean that because when we say all my gold and all my silver we mean all our possession we want to give everything to god well it's now time to fulfill that promise of the song we sang the bible passage that is very you know i always like when i'm talking about the collections the book of philippians chapter 4 which was written by Paul to the Philippians. If you look at it in verse 15, it says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, which I departed from Macedonia, no ch church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Verse 17. 
Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephraditus the thing which was sent from you, an order of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. As we are giving to God this morning, let's remember that Bible passage. A sacrifice acceptable and well pleasing to God. And he concludes in verse 19, that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not all your wants, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for you are the giver of all good things. You give up everything. We thank you that you love us so much that even you give us your son. It's time for us to give back to you. We pray that you help us to be able to give accordingly. Knowing very well that you will continue to supply all our need according to your riches in glory. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First time to sing. First time to sing is welcome. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has taught. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to relieve. Let us do with our mind what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hold, let us watch and pray, and live up to a master call. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and his banner, our glory shall be, while we hail all the tide in salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope and trust, let us watch and pray, and labor till the master comes. To the work, to the work, there is labor for all, for the kingdom of darkness and error shall fall. And the name of Jehovah exalted shall be, in the loud swelling for us, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope and trust, let us watch and pray, and live until the master Let's pray. Go on now, Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the time we've been given to worship you this morning and pray that the worship was acceptable to you, Father. And we thank you for the message that we've heard. We pray that you'll strengthen us and as we strive to be your servants, Father. And pray that as we leave here, that you'll be with us throughout the week and until we meet together again to worship you, Father. We love you, Father, and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.